everybody. Welcome to Pale in Comparison, a proud member of the Doof Network. In this podcast, my sister uses her knowledge of the otherverse to take a look at Pact, Wildbo's least appreciated work, and I try to not give away any spoilers. I'm Jenny, and Malia convinced me to read one. I'm Malia, and Jenny convinced me to read everything else. This episode, we are covering Histories, Arc 2. Before we get into that, however, I'd like to issue a spoiler warning. This podcast is filled with pale spoilers. If you don't know why the Carmine Beast didn't fight back against the Hungry Choir and don't want us to tell you, stop now, read Pale, and come back to this podcast. As for Pact, there will be full spoilers through the chapter we are covering. All right, so really short summary. We get to look into Maggie's past. Pretty much sums it up. Um, (laughs) Yeah, how did you do with this chapter, Malia? It was really good and really interesting. But I was telling Jen earlier, I really put off doing my notes for this chapter because I always read the chapter once and then read it again and take notes. And I just like couldn't get myself to do this one again. Um, But I'm really glad I did. There were a lot of things I understood a lot more reading it the second time. Yeah. But it was hard. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah, I'm also just really like still not convinced that these are like goblins but by the time i got to the end of it i became more and more convinced that like yeah these were just goblins and like that sucks yeah well we start the chapter with maggie at school talking with a friend basically sees something very grotesque outside of the school yeah um first note she's listening to the fiddle violin and drums is she listening to irish music like i was just like this is specific but also where are you like where does she live like what is going on hey you don't have to live anywhere specific to enjoy like the wonderful like irish music right just like there. her name is maggie and she's listening to irish music which is fine i'm just like trying to figure her out i guess that's fair but i mean i definitely know some non-irish people that still listen to gaelic storm um that's which fair. is a pretty great band if you guys haven't heard them Real super good. sweet um, <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, I kind of liked that little <laughs> bit of detail in there. <laughs> yeah. My second thought was that she's like, she seems kind of like a bitch. Like, I feel like she seems more like a bitch than she has so far. I don't know if she just started like becoming more performative in her desire to please people or if she's like changed or whatever and i mean everyone who has friends who like annoy them and you know maybe sometimes you try to be nice to them or whatever but it's just kind of like oh like this person is annoying sometimes but just the way that she approached or like that she dealt with heather in this situation was frustrating um and just throughout this whole thing she's like i don't like people and i don't like friends and i hate everyone and i'm kind of like what is your deal are you is this just like weird teenager mode like i don't get her i feel like i kind of take it as like yeah teenager stuff and heather says in here is one year younger um which she probably just thinks of her as more annoying than younger yeah you know which is not doesn't mean it's okay to do but i feel like that's a pretty common thing as a teenager to do (laughs) right (laughs) yeah but yeah then they go outside and there's a bunch of people that are trying to get away from this really fucked up looking thing that she keeps calling an art piece yeah it's really gross maggie's like inability to see the truth as like someone who still has innocence is interesting throughout this chapter or like someone who isn't aware Mm -hmm. um because if she was like oh at first i thought it was like a person and then it was like no and then i was like questioning her and i was like wait was it a person and you're like mind is rewriting it so it doesn't look as horrifying um but it almost is like more horrifying else they took a dog out of it so i don't know what the fuck this is (laughs) um i kept i kept wanting things to be like demons and not goblins but i don't really think so unless it's like jenny's face is doing weird things (laughs) yeah it's just like i (sighs) cherry pop and (laughs) And, you know, and Pecker's not. I just, uh, I, I don't want the goblins to be evil, but I guess maybe some are and whatever. Because I just like, this is super, super gross, but goblins are super gross, right? And like demons 
would be more well this is a weird thought demons would be like more like fairy a little bit maybe hmm. in terms of like the crazy mind game torture chamber bullshit or something i don't know oh, what makes you think that i don't know <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm still, like, I haven't bought that what fucked Minnie up was a goblin. I just, like, haven't bought that yet. Um, hmm. And that was just, like, it appeared and her, and she went, like, brain dead or whatever. Like, it, it like it wasn't this. This is more, this is, like, there's gross shit everywhere. It's, like, lots of physical brutality and violence. Lots of, like, you know, ooh, arson. Ooh, like, like even though these are a lot worse than what we see goblins do in Pale, this feels more, like, that flavor <laughs> okay whereas like what happened to Minnie still doesn't feel like a goblin to me but the like you know like describing like how blunt goes and makes dog meat or whatever mm -hmm. like running around and having all this like gross shit everywhere and like doing all this stuff and especially at the end when they're like oh this person has figured out a way to get into cities which she can't really because of like the flowing water basically in the pipes mm -hmm. and we don't know if demons have that restriction because it seems like fairy don't. Mm -hmm. Do we know that demons don't have that restriction? I just feel like with Barbatorm, it was like... He can get into wherever. domains. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, this mean. is really hard. I also... So I can't tell if things are just like... If, if if this is a thing or if this is not a thing. Like, are they just all sort of goblin-y demons and it's all just like fine? Or is this like a thing? And I don't know. Like a thing that is normal for goblins, you mean? Or like... Or like... Like, is this a thing in the story that we will learn that, like, oh, Minnie's goblin was actually a demon and that's important? You know, like, it feels mm. like what happened to Molly and how she died was important because we keep learning about it and we keep hearing about it and we keep coming back to it. But this is, like, me being like, wait, I didn't think goblins were like this. Like, this is stuff I'm bringing into this story. This yeah. is, it's, like, if I was just reading this, I'd be like, oh, fuck goblins, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting, uh, hearing your perspective on it, for sure. Yeah, I also, it seems like, reading this description, I thought maybe this wasn't the first instance of this happening, because everyone seems like, not like, oh, this is totally fine, but it like it didn't seem, I don't know, it seemed like maybe this wasn't the first time this sort of thing had happened, but then later they referred to it like it was. But I think it was just like the innocence or unawareness or whatever kind of rewriting mm -hmm what was going on and yeah just that keeps cropping up until they they're finally made aware at the end of the chapter and it's just really interesting yeah, yeah. that's how i took it when i read it um just because like i mean even in real life you know if you see something mm. that's really fucked up or like like really hurt in a car accident or anything like that like mm -hmm. your brain kind of tends to like make it look more fake a lot of the times um mm. that's kind of a coping type of deal um yeah and i know a lot of like a lot of patients that i had when i worked in the emergency room that would come in with traumas it either kind of says to how my brain was thinking it was fake or how good movies have gotten <laughs> with hmm. special effects because a lot of times i'd be like oh like that kind of looks like yeah <laughs> Ew. but but i feel i mean besides just gore and all that kind of stuff you know i feel like there's other instances where you know, in your own life where you can probably re recall being like, oh, yeah, I feel like I didn't really feel real or it looked like I was looking at something fake or, you know. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. And especially in like a bigger crowd, you're kind of waiting for someone else to like react or respond. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Yeah. And more people just be like, oh, look, a, a bunch of assholes got this disgusting thing like made of like hamburger meat had a shock value to freak people out and then uh, like vandalism and da 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 da. Maggie sees some kind of creepy guy or what she thinks is a creepy guy and takes like <laughs> like pictures of him and I guess what, what were your thoughts when you first saw him? Yeah I totally thought he was in on it. I was surprised by the twist at the end. It was good. I didn't expect it mm -hmm. but I also like was like oh that's a practitioner and I was a little bit confused because I I thought from her description at some point earlier on that like this was a goblin led thing not like a practitioner who was out to fuck with goblins probably in like the last chapter the way she was talking about it so that was that did confuse me a bit but i was like yeah that dude's in on it fuck that guy mm -hmm. yeah it do he does seem really suspicious from maggie's point of view doesn't he 
<laughs> well, and then we'll talk about this uh, later yeah. when she meets him again. Oh, it's a 3B. I didn't realize that. Okay. Oh, my God. Anyway, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but when she meets him next time, um, he really doesn't help make himself seem not suspicious. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He does not but, help yeah. that at all. <laughs> Well, basically, then um, next scene, Maggie has a conversation with her dad in the car. Um, they talk about a bunch of stuff, and then very end, they come across a fire where there's three houses on fire. So I'm really hoping that this means that her mom lives out of town. I think that's sort of what I've decided by the end of this, because at the end, her dad's like, "Oh, Chris can go take her to her mom or whatever," which makes me think that her mom is not in the town, mm, um, mm-hmm. which is good. <laughs> yeah. That is good. But yeah, and it, this was interesting learning about her dads and what that means. Still don't know why she said the dads, but I guess she is weird and a bittery teenager person. Um, <laughs> her dad seemed wonderful, um, mm-hmm. like really just cool and want to talk to her and kind of give her a hard time, but also just like super like caring, great, awesome. I also like that the relationship with their mom or with Maggie's mom is good like that's fun he's like yeah we're all gonna like get old and live together like it was just like kind of nice um Mm -hmm. like it seems like our parents are like fairly healthy well-adjusted people and so i'm Mm -hmm. like i don't get why you're like this maggie like i don't get it she's like i'm miserable i'm like why i mean sometimes teenagers are just little shits you know i guess it's just like you, you grow up and you look back and you cringe really hard you know it's just part of life you cringe you're like, well, fuck. I mean, even if you're not that type, like, probably were cringy in different ways as a teenager. I know as sure as hell I was. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I was very much like, I want a boyfriend. But, like, I wasn't <laughs> like, I'm an asshole for no reason. Like, I don't know. Yeah, but, like, I mean, I feel like we all knew somebody who was like that. I feel like mm. you might be being a little bit hard on Maggie but I mean I feel like you might be being a little bit hard on her maybe but I mean I'm not gonna lie you're being unfair to Maggie what was that why but M (laughs) this is why but M you're being unfair to Maggie (laughs) (laughs) I mean I'm not gonna lie she does have some kind of irritating traits in this stuff but I don't think it's like unique to her necessarily I feel like I've some people are just kind of like that but yeah, I mean, I just, I'm just trying to figure her out. Honestly, this didn't bother me as much the first time I read this mm. chapter. It's more like the second time. I've just been like, I'm just really struck by how b- bitter and unhappy and negative she is or something. And I'm like, I'm yeah. trying to figure out why and I don't get it. And it's interesting, like, because she's like, oh, I want to take like the easiest major and like, oh, I don't want to have to do anything. And oh, I guess I'll go to university and learn that like drugs can make me feel like I really have friends or whatever the fuck. Like, I think that there is probably some social stuff going on where she like wants friends or something, but yeah. her dad says like, we have the power. Um, and she says, I think like that'll change one day. I'll be all powerful, which just like seems to be the core of Maggie's character and drive. Mm-hmm. But like, I almost want to say she wants the power so that she can like choose to not do shit because like she doesn't, I wouldn't describe Maggie as someone who's ambitious, like more so uh, later chronologically where like she's in Jacob's Bell and stuff but like here it just seems like I can't put my finger on like why she wants power other than just to like not have to deal with or listen to anyone like it's not like oh I want it's like like Alexander or whatever and Bristow they all want to like control things and have these like big organizations and have all these like machinations and shit whereas Maggie just like wants power it's weird. She she sort of reminds me of Verona. I'm going to talk about this more later, I think, in our, like, pale in comparison part. Um, mm, okay. But there's just some, like, kind of similarities with, like, her not wanting... She's not very into stuff in school. I think the thing that really made me think of Verona was the divorce. Mm. Wilda seems to have a thing about, like, daughters living with their dad and not their mom. Um, mm. Like, Taylor... But I mean, she didn't have a choice. Lol. Um, and then like Verona and Maggie. And there just seems to be like, because I feel like this, the thing is like, oh, moms tend to get custody because like yeah. the patriarchy or whatever. 
but I'm having a hard time thinking of a mom in a wild boat story who has custody when the dad is an option. That, you know, I never realized that. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, it's neat. Huh. Yeah. It it's is kind of like, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Cause that is like unusual. And stories. are there any boys with single parents? Probably. Uh, I mean, I guess Brian and Aisha sort of. I, yeah, but, that's kind of what I thought, but I was like, well, their mom doesn't really give a fuck anyway, so. And Aisha lived with the mom. Yeah. Anyway, it's just interesting. That's true. Yeah, that's pretty, that is interesting. Yeah, I mean, let that show everybody. I mean, obviously dads can do just as good, if not better job than moms in certain situations, you know. It's like, just because... They can you know, also do worse. They can. <laughs> they can do better or worse. But that's why you should not base uh, who your kid should, uh, who the kid should live with just based on the genitals of someone. You should look at all the factors. Yes. So basically Maggie starts hanging out with her friends, um, kind of a organized thing by one of her dads <laughs> that they're all annoyed about. End up running into the creepy guy. Then they go to her friend Ben's house, and uh, we'll just say there's an intruder there. Yeah, I think it's interesting you chose to use the word friend here. Well, They're just... I mean, she says she doesn't like her friends, but... <laughs> right. Well, but Ben at one point is like, literally nobody likes you. Like, he, like they're all just very antagonistic. And then Jeremy at one point is like, I'm not Ben's friend. I'm literally here because I live near here. And like, they just like, they're all little shitheads um, th- th- in their the own that's special like, way. That's kind of why I think like... Maggie acts like that because her friends all act like that. But like, I had friends. I don't know. Like, it, like okay, these I'm, people don't. Oh well, yeah, like, but her like friends. <laughs> but like, if you grow up with people and they're all acting like little fuck faces, then you might like, and you still choose to hang out with them. Like, I don't you, think you she's might... choosing to hang out with them. <laughs> I mean, ask her later. I don't know. Okay, it's well, it like in this be, scenario, it, it's not like it doesn't seem like it's a real big town. There might not be a lot of options for people. I also can't figure that out. I have I have a lot of thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I don't know when to get into this, but I, oh, I do get into this in the section. I can't figure out why the goblins attack this town in particular. It doesn't strike it like it didn't think think of it as like Kennet, which is like economically depressed and there's all the like drugs and there's all the like whatever and it's like in the middle of nowhere. Like we, I don't feel like we don't get enough information about this town to determine why this happened. Because I feel like there was an explanation in an earlier chapter that was like, oh, goblins find these places and then make them worse. But this place seemed fine. I mean, like, you there did seemed just to- spend a lot of time pointing out how the kids are being such dick faces compared to other things in normal life. Maybe you're attracted to the asshole kids. Well, I think they just don't like each other. I think they're just like not friends with each other, but maybe you're friends with other people or something. Except Maggie. Why do we um, never see her actual friends if that's the case? I think Heather is her friend. And in quotes she doesn't like her right and that's it well i mean i so i this is a bad example because i was actually friends with a bu- bunch of people in our neighborhood but if i just had to like be sent home with like a random selection of kids from my class in high school there's a decent chance i wouldn't like most of them you know like but i still had friends so i was sent home with like a couple of the guys in my class that i just like really didn't like that doesn't mean that everyone is shitty i don't know i mean fair enough i mean I kind of, I just feel like it's a small town. There's probably, like, a small amount of people that you can hang out with. I mean, because, like, even if they're not friends, like, yeah, it it makes sense for her dad to be, like, guys need to all, like, be grouping together because this is a lot of Right, totally. Yeah. Um, But she does say friends that she doesn't like, not just friend. (laughs) So, even if she has other friends. She also is allowed to lie at this point. (laughs) Yes, but we don't, I mean, yes, but like, we're not really getting a good indication that she's lying about that, though. Sure. Yeah. One thing that was weird that I'm having a hard time with is that she's a junior. I don't know how people in other countries classify grades, but I, it seems like she's in 11th grade. Like she's one year away from after she's done with this year, she'll have one year and then she graduates. Mm-hmm. And I keep thinking of her as, like, an eighth grader. And I don't know if it's because Pale has me thinking of, like, people as, like, 13 or whatever. Mm. But, like, I, I've i been listening to Deep Impact just, like, like at le- like an arc delayed so that it doesn't influence my thinking too much. 
Okay. Um, but they were l- saying that they were looking through some of the old comments and that a lot of people started like shipping Blake and Maggie like in like 2.1 or something. Really? Because because Maggie's like the only girl anywhere near his age. And I was like, ew, that's super gross. Like she's a child. Like, ew. And now I'm like, okay, like still not necessarily appropriate, but not like she's 13 like or 14 or whatever. I'm just having a weird time with the ages in this story. <laughs> Um, but also she does things and acts in a certain way sometimes that make me think of her as younger. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, obviously like this whole chapter here kind of goes over her traumatic experiences and everything, but I feel mm-hmm. like if you look at, um, I mean, our protagonists in Pale, they all were kind of, I mean, they were all picked because they were all a little bit close to, um, otherness, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. so I'm like, I feel like it'd be fair to say that they all had to grow up a little bit faster in certain ways Hmm. at a young age. Whereas like, it seems like even though Maggie has really shit friends or a really (laughs) shit friend or I don't know. I mean, her friend's fine. She's the asshole. (laughs) Okay, fine. Her friend's fine. Everybody (laughs) else, her one friend is fine. Everybody else kind of sucks because like her one, her one, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> her one friend that we know exists is fine everybody yeah. else is either an asshole or homophobic but <laughs> but besides that like it seems like she has had a pretty like normal upbringing with like she's had like her mom and her dads all get along and like her mm-hmm. dads seem like they really care about her and like mm-hmm. so she probably didn't have to mature quite as quickly um mm-hmm. as everybody else and Blake you know he you just know he had to fucking mature quick as fuck yeah well also yeah also if Blake is like 20 and she's like 16 I don't know how old anyone is like that's not really appropriate <laughs> oh, um, oh no so sure. they don't have any chemistry at all so yes there's that. <laughs> I, w- I wasn't agreeing with the ship I'm just <laughs> right making I'm just sure you know that. <laughs> bringing the circle back to yes bring the circle that back comment to yes um speaking of maggie being an asshole (laughs) she just like is like picking fights with people kind of and like trying to be all like not happy about things or whatever and she like specifically calls ben out for saying cul-de-sac and i'm like cul-de-sac is not a weird word like it's been like especially if you live on one like a cul-de-sac isn't a dead end road exactly because it it, like go it has the, the convenient little circle thingy right true a dead end road it's just like oh it stopped like get fucked like do a three-point turn um i mean i'm not gonna lie i didn't start saying (laughs) cul-de-sac for like probably an embarrassingly long time um but we didn't but you know like i think if you live on one yeah um it's not there's a decent chance your parents are gonna say constantly oh we live at the end of the cul-de-sac and you're just gonna be like cool yeah that's true yeah, maybe you're um, right. She's being an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> um, although, because my first read through, I didn't get why this was here. But my second read through, like, I realized that it did really raise the tension of what was going on in the scene because, like, this house is at a dead end. Like, Maggie has to go one way out of this place. Like, she's kind of trapped. Um, mm. Or, like, there's a she doesn't have as many options of escaping at the end. And I think that's kind of why this was pointed out. Um, or, like, yeah. one of the reasons. And I, I think it was just really clever to, like, it set the scene and helped me picture what was going on, like, on the street. But also later was like, oh, fuck, what if they're out there at the end of this whatever? Mm-hmm. Um, and made Ben seem possibly a little bit preppy or something and made Maggie seem like an asshole or something. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> like, maybe it's like a, like bougie pretentious thing to say cul-de-sac in which case i'm sorry i think the bougie pretentious thing is knowing that it's not cul-de-sacs it's calls to sack um at least i'm pretty sure <laughs> that might be a lie <laughs> i mean i've never heard that but then again uh Let me Google it. i haven't heard a lot of things so it's very possible calls de sack what's the plural of cul-de-sac huh all right guys we get to see if malia it's, is just it, making it stuff is calls de sack in french so it'd be like or something i don't know i don't speak french but i think because we're americans cul-de-sacs is also acceptable Mm -hmm. but maggie's in canada is she that's another question i don't know where this bitch is i took it as canada 
Yeah. I mean, I don't think there she was hopped countries. Um, for some reason where I was like, where is she? I, I feel like I'm pretty sure she's still in Canada. Um, I don't okay. know exactly where, but a little town of Canada somewhere. Um, sure. I mean, that would make sense. I mean, maybe not French Canada. So, I don't know. Definitely not if she doesn't know what a fucking cul-de-sac is. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> sorry. Okay. I feel like we're just like just hilarious if we get comments or like people are like "fuck you," I'm French and like I don't call it a <laughs> cul-de-sac or like I don't know. Um, yeah, French Canadians, let us know. <laughs> if you're a French Canadian, yeah, I mean, I mean, if you've been listening to us, you know we butcher everything that we say. So, um, yeah, <laughs> it's it's not going to stop anytime yeah. soon. Um, not for lack of trying, but yeah. So we go over. Um, run into the creepy dude who tries to again get her to like he tr- basically tries to take her phone from her he's not doing a great job of not being like super sketch he's doing a super bad job yeah i am starting to slowly think of a theory about this but i don't know exactly what type of practitioner would be able to do this but i'll talk about it in th- in the three beat when we see him again but yeah he really doesn't do a good job of being not super fucking creepy like yeah when they were like, oh, are you, like, is this a picture of someone who's involved? And he, like, doesn't say anything. Like, yeah, he's involved, but he's involved because he's trying to stop it. Like, it, like, you know, not even Verona. I think, like, Avery, who doesn't pride herself as being Ed's good at all the word stuff or whatever, would be able to be like, um, I'm, like, I'm not destroying this town. Or, like, I'm, like... I'm working to prevent this or like I want everyone to be okay or like literally something he literally didn't have to something. like not say anything and then why is he like you're going to bleed like what the fuck like don't say <laughs> it out loud cuz like what if she doesn't and also like just why just that was so unnecessary like I get that he's frustrated I get that he's really trying to help out and he's like hey girl you're going to die cuz those pictures like draw a connection between us that people can see and I can't tell you that (laughs) like it's you know it makes sense but it's also just like what the fuck yeah I mean it's it it does (laughs) suck because it's like yeah like I I don't blame Maggie for you know how she's reacting and all that but yeah it's just like uh it's just not helping at all but you don't but like you don't really realize that until um well like (sighs) total end but it, this is kind of one of the characteristics i like in maggie like her i mean her stubborn, stubbornness is often not great but often like is cool and useful mm-hmm. i like that she took the picture of him in the first place yeah. um she kind of had like the courage to do that and then she sort of like stuck with it and in this situation she's like you know like no like i'm not doing it um she tries to take the pictures to the police later like i just i like this part of her yeah and it it's just really ironic, I guess, that, like, he's trying to save her. But ultimately, I think that she, that he found her and told them to leave because of the pictures. Like, maybe she would have lived at the end, depending on how the people do, after he's told them how to try to fight the goblins or whatever. But I, th- I think that, like, if she hadn't taken these pictures, he wouldn't have gone and found her. Yeah, I think you're probably right about that. Yeah, and the neighbor comes out and seems cool and tries to, like, you know, protect them or whatever. Yeah, he does seem really, really cool. Yeah. And then Maggie's like, oh, he's a pedo. And I was just like... Fuck you, Maggie. (laughs) Yes! And, like, it's scary because, like, you know, pedophiles exist and are often, like, you know, like, people you wouldn't expect or whatever. And they hold, like, certain positions of power and, like, different things. And, like, you know, it's really scary and, like... It made me, like, for a second be like, oh, God, is he? But Ben is just like, no, fuck you. Like, don't say that. And it's just sort of like, I like that he got mad at her. And I'm just really hoping that he's not a pedophile. I, I don't think he's a pedophile. Um, but I feel like Maggie um, makes terrible, inappropriate jokes in situations where she's, well, in normal situations, but probably more so in situations where she's extra stressed out. So yeah, I guess this could have been her attempt to make a masturbation joke like the others were or whatever, like along that line. It just didn't feel funny. It felt mean. Yeah, it did. But I'm, I'm just saying like, you know, and, 
it felt like mean girls, you know, with like the burn book and it's like, oh, she's a pusher, you know, like she pushes drugs. Like that's what it felt like more. I think you're, I, I, I agree. <laughs> but again, like she did just get like essentially assaulted by some crazy guy. So I could see her yeah. trying to like make a terrible joke to lighten her own tension. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Again, fucked up to say. Still shouldn't say it, but I'm saying, like, I'm trying to give her the benefit of the doubt a little bit, because, yeah, she is not coming off great. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> Well, and it's weird, because, like, I mean, I leave the chapter still liking her. Yeah. But thinking, like, just, like, not understanding why she's such an asshole. <laughs> yeah, I mean, although I, I would say, like, you know, the tension keeps ramping up, you know, over the chapter, so you could right. say, like, that's probably not helping either. But right, right, right. Do we want to talk about lore? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, kind of interesting because she did seem like, I don't know, like at least before she started talking about that. Well, yeah, she's talked, a, she, she didn't say a lot beforehand, but like, um, right. She basically is like, oh, like, you know, like, interesting. We're sitting together with, you know, what your dads are. Right. Just like Well oh. like like before before this she was it was like, oh, she's like holy lore and she's like the prude and like whatever, but she like gets in a really good well timed joke about masturbation mm-hmm. um and said something else. Like she just I think it was just like she seemed like not an asshole, which made me be like, Ooh, I like you <laughs> Like she wasn't an yeah. asshole and she wasn't annoying and it was like, Ooh, cool. But then yeah, they're sitting down at this table and just out of fucking nowhere she's like, Oh, I never thought I'd sit at a table with you. Like your dads are homosexual. Like, it's like oh, you're I'm being a- such a big person by like yeah. sitting at a piece of wood with you. And I was just like, what the fuck? This is yeah. so unnecessary. Yeah. Why are you bringing this up? Yeah. Like now you're totally a dick. I mean, I, yeah. it, it's good to understand. Like, if, yeah, if you're from a family who's like been indoctrinating you with like these kind of views, like hope, I mean, yeah. you still have time to grow up. Hopefully you'll look back at this. Well, I mean, she won't because she's probably dead. But, like, hopefully normally you'd look back at this and be like, well, that was really shitty of me. Like, that's really cringy. Like, you know, some people just need to grow up a little bit more, get a little bit different worldview and realize that, like, you know, if you're gay, that does not change anything in terms of, like, your morality or, like, it just literally means, you know, what kind of genitals you like, (laughs) you know, (laughs) which is okay. Like, you can... I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just was like, she just brought this up apropos of nothing. Like, it just felt incredibly unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And like, and then she says, I can look past what your parents are. Like, what your parents are. And I was like, oh my God. Talk about dehumanizing someone. Yeah. And just also like, what the fuck? And like, I, and like, this to me was like, oh, is this why Maggie's so like angry and bitter and hates everyone? Like, is it just like she's ah. experiencing like kind of like the homophobia like aimed at her dads? Like, at one point, her later, her dad are like, or like Chris is like, this is, we, we, it took so hard for us to find a place where all three of us could live together. And I couldn't oh. figure out if that was like a, because all the other towns you tried to live in were super homophobic or, you all have very particular living styles. <laughs> like I couldn't tell what it was necessarily yeah. because like, um, this was, this was the thing where I was like, is this why you're so, or is this part of why you're so angry and bitter? Um, cause this, you know, this, this beat mm-hmm. is here for a reason. And I'm, um, I mean, it doesn't make a show lot of that, sense. Like, there are people in the town who are hostile toward Maggie's family. Mm hmm. Which, I mean, it would suck regardless, but it extra sucks because her dad seemed, like, so fucking cool. So <laughs> like, fucking cool. He seemed like cool. the nicest guys. Like, really good dads, too. Right. Um, well, then there's also the beat later where she hadn't... She used to call Chris Papa, but then she hadn't for a long time. Mm-hmm. And that... It makes me wonder if this is kind of part of it. And, like, saying, like, the dads and not my dads. Like, I wonder if she feels weird or insecure or something about it. Yeah. Like, I see that. I think she loves them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just, it was also like, 
I'll just talk about the pop thing now since I brought it up. It was real weird that like she used to call him that and she doesn't anymore because it was like, oh, how long have these two been together? It seems like a long time. And then like Maggie became a teenager and decided she was just going to like be a dick to everyone around her all the time. <laughs> and part of that is by like treating Chris more like, I mean, some more shittily. Yeah. Yeah. And like, it seems like some people, you know, call their step parents by their first name or whatever. And some people do say like mom or whatever. And it just seems like rude to go backwards if that makes sense what do you mean what do you mean rude to go backwards to go from papa to chris oh yeah well yeah it does i mean she Um, might just be like oh i'm yeah it might just be a teenager thing like i'm too fucking cool or i mean it probably it could be a protective but then call your other dad by his first name too i don't know yeah i mean it could it could be what i'm trying to say like especially if she's in a real homophobic town like if she's hanging out with like her dad's like, maybe she gets less shit if she calls one dad and the other one, like, Chris. Because she's not, maybe. I mean, like, they probably could see past that, but maybe, I don't know. I'm just like, maybe she gets a little bit less shit if she's not saying, like, oh, my papa and yeah. my dad. Some straight people really just, like, don't remember that gay people exist. So maybe they think, like, oh, that's a brother or a friend from yeah. out of town or, like, whatever. Yeah, which is shitty, but, I mean. Yeah. Okay, so back to, like, more of the chapter after that. Um, Ben goes upstairs. Maggie ends up going up after a little bit and sees uh, Ben and his mom, like, laying face down on a bed and some really fucking creepy people there that she's like, ah, who are you guys? This was a really good horror beat, I thought. Um, It was very... It's like we got to the house, you know, we got to like sanctuary and they were all together and it felt like, I don't know, there was that neighbor watching out for them and it just kind of, I felt safe in the house. Mm -hmm. Um, And then going upstairs and just like very abruptly being like, no. Um, And it was, it wasn't like, it it was another visual cue that something was very wrong without being like a jump scare or whatever. Like how in the beginning it was like, Oh, here's a creepy like art thing. This was like, Oh, they're lying down on the bed. Like very much like this is wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. But not like, like a dude just suddenly jumping out of a closet with a knife or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. Like it was, a, it was a really good beat of like nowhere is safe. And um, it makes me really upset thinking that like they followed her through the phone and that's why all these people died but like they were all probably going to die eventually anyway in this town yeah. so <laughs> yeah and it, it, her standing there being like oh is that an older brother like what do I do like was it was another instance it seemed of the her brain trying to like make sense of things yeah um and I was like fucking leave <laughs> like and it just like her leaving through the window like made me think that like you know maybe the other people in the house were like already dead or about to die or like something and I just like uh because I was hoping people would, the others would like run out or something when they heard the window break. But I don't know. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I was glad that she was able to get out. Yeah. And I guess uh, kind of a random thought, like she did end up bleeding. Hmm. Like, do you think that guy knew that that was going to happen? And that's why I said that. Bleed, bleed is also such a weird thing to bring up, like. It's not like, oh, you're going to die or like you're going to get hurt or like something a little more generic, like you're going to bleed is like real a lot. I mean, maybe it's like maybe they take the bodies and then bleed them and bathe in the blood or whatever, like it said later. And maybe that's why he said that. I don't know. I mean, I'm just asking if you thought that like her getting cut by the glass as she jumped out the window had anything to do with that because she literally bled that same chapter. Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) I mean, it might not. But I'm just like, hey, I guess he's not gainsaid or whatever. <laughs> right. I mean, he didn't put super good time restrictions on it. But yeah, it seems like that would be good in the spirit size. Yeah. I mean, it, it counts. Yeah. So, well, basically, yeah, she she escapes. Two days later, things keep sucking more and more and more. <laughs> yeah. So the first day was friday and this is thursday so it seems like the town like completely falls apart and apart in one week um because it's like no school no cell phone or like no phones or whatever i was confused as to how the 
phone system worked because I didn't understand why, how the goblins could fuck with the cell phones by cutting the power lines, quote unquote, or the phone lines or whatever. I don't know. I just, we roll, I rolled with it. It's satellites. Well, How do phones work? Well, for one, maybe they could have <laughs> just been like, maybe she also meant like the phone towers were messed up. But also, yeah. it might just be a practice thing. And so that was her innocence, like, way of being like, oh, mm. like, my phone's not working, so it must be the phone lines. So maybe she doesn't know that phone lines don't really <laughs> affect the cell phone service. Yeah, well, I think the practitioner even says that, like, the lines are down or something. I mean, they might but... be down. But, I mean, yeah. it, it, there, there could also be phone towers in the area down or something. Or it could That's be true. a practice thing. And they just were like, I mean kind of a lot of talking to be like oh the the power lines and the phone lines and the, and the cell towers <laughs> yeah i don't know but yeah cops suck um <laughs> um she like goes and shows in the pictures and stuff and it's like oh they like didn't give a fuck and i get that they're probably getting a lot of tips and they're really like overloaded or whatever but if mm-hmm. there's police officers like in the station at all it seems like some of them should like try um yeah maybe they're freaked out about their own families and i mean it's not a good thing but maybe they're just sure like, but try to keep our own family safe because everybody else is fucked. but then like why are you at work like go home be with your family just because they're assuming they will still get don't a just sit there in the police station and not do shit i mean <laughs> i guess yeah, they'll still get paid though they got more weapons at the police station yeah at one point maggie seems to think that like more people have like the violence has escalated in a way that like she's like are people joining in? Like, are people coming from out of town? What is this? And I feel like I remember them saying that goblins are, like, attracted to that sort of thing. So I bet a bunch more goblins have, like, flooding into the area. Mm. And I want to think that it's, like, a demon leading a bunch of goblins. But I think it's still maybe just a bad goblin who yeah. paid some people's blood. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Or, like, there's not a good delineation necessarily between them or something. Sure. <laughs> Does that sound Ooh. convincing? <laughs> From what we've heard about demons and how people react to demons, do you think that um, this seems like a bad enough thing for a demon to do? No. <laughs> I mean, because in the at the council meeting, Laird explicitly is when Maggie's like, "I've seen this whole town get destroyed," and Laird's like, huh, "Please." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I mean that's the thing, it doesn't seem as horrifying as how Barbatorum was described. Um like I it they're all individual acts that I can see goblins doing, you know, like lighting things on fire and like killing people in their houses. My one of my things is like, how are they not fucked? Like how is their like the innocent shield or whatever not fucking ruining these people? Mm. Is that important? <laughs> it feels important. Could be. <gasps> <laughs> is Maggie a vestige? <laughs> hmm. That could be a bold and specific prediction. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Johanna's going around. <laughs> vestiges. Well, basically, um, we keep going on. Um, one of her dads ends up <laughs> uh, joining the neighborhood watch. Maggie convinced him to bring her and Chris along. They end up seeing the strange man again who finally convinces her to delete the photos. Tells him to get the fuck out of there. But they run into some terrifying people. A really freaky lady. Essentially was forced to make an oath. Yeah, the neighborhood watch is a bad idea. And y'all need to leave. Y'all need to have left already. And I get that it's like scary. And people are still kind of thinking like, oh, my life will still continue in this place. But... This is like a natural disaster and you need to get out. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm also wondering what the practitioner says to the people. It seems he's like, I found the biggest group of them I could and I told them how to beat you or whatever, or like tricks, like ways to fight you. And so, but he also said like, do I wait until these people are aware so I can talk to them truthfully or do I lie to try to convince them because I think that like either because trying to make them all aware is too risky or he just doesn't think it would work yeah. or something but that was interesting and I wonder what he told them and I wonder if those people lived and if they're all fucking aware now 
I'm also thinking about, well, okay, so I have like two questions. Question number one is like, when did Maggie awaken? And then question number two is like, what kind of practitioner is this dude? And I don't know what to address first. <laughs> what do you mean awaken? Like, well, okay, so. Like become aware or you mean actually awaken? Well, if we see the moment she becomes aware, right? Um, mm-hmm. When she like finally realizes like she can't like. Uh, like she can't oh. explain all this away. Right. Like when she's looking at the goblin demon queen lady whatever god and the whole weird thing about the three days and the three nights makes me think she's a demon i don't know anyway um isn't that just a practice thing but the whole like and then she will rest and won't come back for thousands of years or whatever the fuck that doesn't feel like oh yeah that's just a goblin like i don't know i don't know i hate this i feel like you Um, really don't want to be just a goblin i don't want it to be a goblin Goblins are better than this, except they're not. Okay. Um, <laughs> the guy. Uh, right. But then she like she like kind of makes a promise or something, or like she she makes a deal. She agrees, sort of, to like go through two more horrible times of this ish mm-hmm. in response or in in payment for being let go. But it seems like why does that stick to her if she's not? awoken and when we think about the about section in pale which one of the three things is this she's obviously not from a practitioner family i want to say it's like she stumbled across something that's something being the horrifying circumstances of her life but i don't know if those things are like this is how you awaken or this is how you become aware because it feels like stumbling across something in a library isn't the same as awakening because you haven't like made promises unless you like read the book and then make promises i don't know yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to decide how to mark this one prediction in the prediction tracker. Um. Uh. Okay. Yeah. So this guy. Mm-hmm. Um. Oh my god. <laughs> I just had a stupid thought, and I'm gonna say it. Do it. I'm never gonna let this go. What if this guy is a karmic law practitioner? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Malia. <sighs> I'm never gonna let it go. Okay, well, so this is this is why I don't think I still don't know what that is, right? Okay. <laughs> um, so he's slippery, right? And and the the goblin lady keeps talking about luck and mm-hmm. slipperiness. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that this guy like can wield karma or like utilize karma or like transfer karma or something. He can do something with karma. Um, that like helps him evade and hunt this goblin but makes him look like creepy as fuck to everyone else because they're like oh yeah he's like this like creepy homeless guy and like people keep like misunderstanding what he's doing or whatever and it feels like charles like it almost feels like he's forsworn ish and has really bad karma because he's like he looks grungy and homeless and he like is creepy as fuck and says dumb shit but then he also uses his luck and slipperiness to evade this goblin lady. And mm-hmm. he gave his slipperiness and his luck to all the people back in that house. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you can transfer karma, but like, fuck it. Why not? I guess if um, anyone would know, it'd be a lawyer, right? Hmm. <laughs> 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 I'm like, oh, it's like assets or something that feels transactional. I don't know shit about that. Um, the but then i'm like ooh, if this is a thing is charles not really forsworn is charles the slippery karma master did charles orchestrate everything but then what if he's not forsworn what's the reason yeah okay i feel like (laughs) he's probably forsworn yeah okay (laughs) (laughs) uh (sighs) Um, those were my thoughts about this man. I don't know what else it is <laughs> or would be, but I think it's cool. It's also a bummer that he like dies horribly or whatever, probably. Probably? I mean, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> we don't see it. He might not be dead. That's the rule. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting learning where Maggie gets her book from. You know, it's this guy. Yeah, and right? I'm pretty sure he's dead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but... Yeah, so he had a bunch of different items with him. He had that book. He 
had some uh, wand, um, set a set of large fat gold coins, a piece of chalk, and then yeah. So yeah, I mean, it seems like the book is like the thing Maggie takes to learn about the practice. Yeah, his wand was his implement. I'm not entirely sure what the gold coins were, um, but they feel. Oh my god! See, they're in Ireland. Okay, this feels like a like luck magic thing, and he's a leprechaun, and those are the gold coins that he's able to store karma in, which is also <laughs> luck. <laughs> And he like, you know, the magic coins at the end of the rainbow. Why didn't they just and think that the goblins looked like evil leprechauns then instead of people? If they're in Ireland. Yeah, actually, huh? they probably would have thought they were leprechauns well, or something. Well, maybe, shit. maybe. I don't think people in Ireland actually think leprechauns are real. But <laughs> um. Well, she doesn't really describe them as goblins, so maybe she thought they were. They, also people were some guys. people think fairies are real and if you're in ireland you're probably more likely yeah, than but, the average uh, person to think fairies real yeah but i'm not thinking that the average person actually is like oh yeah like that, this is a reasonable explanation there's there's leprechauns that snuck into my house with knives that are like yeah. like well does she she doesn't take the gold coins does she or does she is he like because he's like he explicitly says like the one will help you and he's like, don't take the book. Just forget what is going on. It just says she picks through the things, coins, the wand. And it says she picks up the book. So I don't know if she took the coins or not. But yeah. Yeah. They're not leprechauns. <laughs> is, is that going like a... to be your no. prediction? <laughs> used to be like, all right, Maggie is secretly, but not secretly from Ireland. And that's, oh, there you go, Malia. This is your prediction. She was mistaken that they were goblins. They actually were leprechauns, and leprechauns are like the most evil thing ever. Other than apparently. demons. That makes sense. Did you say that makes sense? <laughs> <I'm>, no. <laughs> okay, this is a great example, everyone, um, of your brain trying to convince you of something. Okay. <laughs> Even if it's really obvious that that's not the case. Um, right here. <clears throat> Gold coins are important, and I don't know why. Um, maybe he works for like an Orem or something, and so he was sent in to try to make the city not suck, and then he failed. I don't know, but like, yeah, people are hunting her. I don't know. Thinking about the whole, I was like, oh, does she need to be awakened for the oath to stick? But like, Louise made that deal, and it stuck. So I guess maybe you have to maybe just be aware or maybe not even that because i'm thinking like if she hadn't taken the book and had just gone off like she would have had two more super fucking awful experiences like yeah. i think it's i would she should take the book and she should try to fight it and it just sucks i don't know or like mitigate it yeah i mean some like practitioners never want the aware to know what the fuck's going on which i mean sometimes yeah. is valid but sometimes i'm like feel like it could help him out a little bit more than you're saying. Right. Well, I think like, I think someone needs to awaken Clem. Yeah. Or like tell her what's up. Cause I think that she would have a lot more. I mean, maybe it would be more dangerous for her, but she already knows like, Oh, there's these fucking objects everywhere. And you know, like I think she'd have a lot more control over her life if she was awoke. And yeah. No, I agree. Like that girl just, I mean, yeah, she fucking needs some, she needs some assistance. With her, I think it's more like she's risky because she keeps running into so much shit. And so, like, if something really bad happens to her, that sucks for you. Like, she just hasn't gotten to the point where she's, like, full-on capital A aware. Yeah. It seems. She's pretty like, enough. I mean, she's pretty aware. She's pretty close, but she it's not like she's a witch hunter, right? Yeah, I mean, there's different levels of aware, but, like... Right. She's definitely well, I capital think she's, A aware. Right. There seems to still be some gap between where she is and where she would need to be for you to not have any karmic backlash if something bad happens to her. Yeah, that's fair. Anyway, this deal is interesting. Okay. What I understand from this deal is she's like, I'm going to make a grand three beat where you will experience blood and darkness and fire two more times. And in return, I'll let all of you live. That seems to be the bargain. Yeah. But like, I don't get why she has the power to make this happen or why even the like agree to forget thing had the power to make this happen. Cause it feels like people should just go around being like, Hey, like make me dinner. And like, 
in exchange, you're going to have amazing sex for the rest of your life. Like, it just, like, doesn't make sense. <laughs> like, it's just, like, like, why don't people just go around making, like, fucking awesome deals and then be like, the universe will will it. Like, it's I mean, like I the guess, opposite of everything. Like, uh, how can she be, like... like a, if maybe it still has to be within that person's power to make it happen. I mean, but she even says, like, maybe it won't be me. I don't know. Blah. Like, and, like, Maggie later is like, what do you know about prophecy? Yeah. I mean, someone could try to give you amazing sex for the rest of your life <laughs> but also like maybe not with me like i don't know i just like i feel like there's been talk about the spirits when you like say things or whatever like will kind of conspire to try to help make it happen or something um like verona and bristow she was like i'll play up the drama for y'all and you'll like it like give me more of a chance or whatever and spirits want to make things that's why they don't like when you break your word and stuff because mm-hmm. they want things to happen like accordingly. And so I think there's a little bit of a like shove to make that happen. But also like the Louise thing, it's like, how did they make Louise magically forget and then magically remember them magically not forget? Just because she was like, yep, cool. Like this just seems like this like incredibly powerful thing that people should run around and use to make everyone's lives better because the universe will be like, well, you said it. So <laughs> am I wrong? <laughs> so if you if you understand how you can make deals to just like fucking make shit happen without mm. doing it yourself or whatever, just just tell me what's happening. All right. Moving on. <laughs> okay. Moving on. One more thing I'm really confused on, y'all. I don't get how Maggie's taking this oath fucked everything up because the practitioner guy is like she had to agree or she had to finish here. Mm. Why? Um couldn't she have just been like, like, it seems like he's like, okay, she had to say, okay, I'll let this family go and then I'll rest. Or she had to just like fucking murder everyone. Like, it seems like she could have just like murdered them and not rested. Like maybe it's something about the way she comes into the world that she had to rest for the three days and three nights thing or whatever. But his whole deal was like rest for three days and three nights. But like, I just didn't get it. Why Maggie making this, agreement to let her family go fucked it up because it seems like if her family if her if the goblin lady had killed her whole family wasn't part of the deal the original deal that was like you can kill me and like rest for three days and three nights that like she wouldn't kill the family um Mm -hmm. but it seemed like she just like didn't give a fuck and just like wasn't gonna do it like she was just like whatever i'm not gonna do any of that because that's all dumb and i don't want to like i don't get how this like like, it felt at the end like, oh, God, Maggie, you, like, made a bad choice in the universe's sense, and you should have let this bitch, like, murder you horribly. But, like, why? I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Um, leave us your thoughts. Leave us, please, somebody, please. Sometimes y'all don't <laughs> actually, and, like, please. <laughs> She's like, this time, please, just do it. <laughs> this time, please, don't explain this to me. Like, nobody was like, oh, yeah, the awakening ritual was weird, and there definitely was something wrong in that description. Nobody nobody said it. Somebody say it, because I'm right. And there should be seven on the middle and six on the outside, or something was weird. Or something was weird. <laughs> I don't, you know. Yeah. All right, moving on <laughs> to the very end here. Um, <laughs> so... Kind of get to the the near past um, where Maggie basically ends up dealing with Laird. Yeah, fucking Laird takes her out to ice cream. This was another moment where I was like, "Is she twelve? Like she's like sitting there with an ice cream and it's like dripping." Okay, um, who, okay, come on, it's fucking ice cream. Are you saying you like you haven't eaten ice cream as an adult and had it melt all over the place and it was too hot? I outside? feel like I haven't been like bribed with ice cream as an adult. Like, I have, like, made the choice to go get ice cream. Oh, my God. This is also the ice cream place that I totally wanted Blake to go to. Blake needs ice cream. Um, But it just, it felt very much like a little girl sitting there being like, ooh, ice cream. Like, okay, I'll murder someone. Like, it just felt, like, juvenile. Well, yeah, I feel like you just are really heavy on the hate Maggie train right now. I just, it's weird because I like her. I just, like, I don't get it. She can Um, eat some fucking ice cream. Right. Like, what the fuck? It's, it's not like it's it's fucking ice cream. It's like it's like Laird took 
fucking Blake to the coffee shop where he got right, nothing. which is what adults drink. Okay, but it's also adults because no one likes to go Blake. To the shop. He's not going to fucking buy Blake ice cream. That's Maybe like he nice would have if he wanted to, like, be little Blake. He would have taken him to buy ice cream and sit, sit there while he ate it. I would be fucking thrilled as a 31-year-old if someone took me out to eat ice cream. And then asked you to murder someone? <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, that part would put a damper on it, but I'd be extra <laughs> pissed if they bought me a shitty coffee, okay? Because I'd be like, at least I got to eat ice cream before being, like, very disturbed. I guess. It could have been decent coffee. Anyway. Okay. Um, I mean, I know this is probably an unpopular opinion, and just, like, just as a disclaimer, I don't tend to drink coffee anyway. I somehow got through nursing school without drinking coffee, which I'm still very proud of myself about. But, I mean... Most of the time, ice cream is going to taste a hell of a lot better than coffee. Coffee yeah, sure. smells great. I have had some coffees that were really damn good. Uh huh. Most coffee is like neutral to not tasty. Sure, I agree with you. Then why the hell would you want coffee instead of ice cream? I'm just saying... Taking someone out to coffee is more professional and adult, or this is a date. Like Being which one is this? this is either like kind of a overrated. cute first date, where he's taking if you a child to go get ice cream, town or this is belittling. <laughs> I mean, also, I guess people in the coffee shop were kind of dicks, so maybe he was like, "I'll take Maggie somewhere where people aren't kind of dicks." Um. Anyway, this makes a lot of sense that Laird was like in on the murder. <laughs> seems to me like Laird did it and is the one responsible for Molly's death Um, because he's like literally you don't need to know anything other than her name and I will like take care of the rest which makes me feel like she that he was like yep we're gonna murder her and that the point behind the world powers metaphor was like I'ma make the murder happen and hide the fact that he like wants to get rid of the Thorburns before before I also feel like she shouldn't necessarily be telling people about the whole prophecy thing but i guess she's like kind of desperate and needs to talk to someone and like if this works maybe it's a good thing but i don't remember there like being fire mentioned with molly's torture maybe there was but if there wasn't then i don't know if this counts um for one of her like fire and darkness and blood things so that sucks i don't, I don't know if this is supposed to necessarily but i feel like it yeah is. no this is because he's like we can make we can mitigate this like we can either like let it happen and make it like it can be super bad or we can like make it so that it, you know bad it happens but it's like not as bad because that's that to me is very is like the most sympathetic version is like this is the way to yeah i guess so but make, i'm like help molly avoid or sorry help maggie avoid crazy fire death awful bad yeah i mean it didn't say that there wasn't fire but. Right, it's just in, like, the 18 visceral descriptions of Molly's body, like, burnt has not been one of them. I'm still upset with you about the ice cream thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You go to law school and suddenly, like, you're too good for I'll take ice cream? I'll ice cream. No! It it's just not feels... Like, I would be thrilled if I had to see a lawyer, like, and they took me out to eat ice cream. As opposed to some coffee that I'm not going to enjoy. I think also that I very much picture Maggie eating ice cream and Laird sitting there without ice cream, which feels like paternalistic and creepy and weird. Whereas if it's like, hey, friends, let's go get ice cream. That's like, fuck, yeah. But like, I'll buy you some ice cream feels weird. But if the discussion question is, if you were going to ask someone to murder someone else, what flavor of ice cream would you buy them? <laughs> yeah. Would you, okay. Would you rather have ice cream or fucking coffee? I mean, it's fine if you want coffee, but I'm just saying, in my opinion, ice cream's better. Whether they had it or not, what beverage or or food item do you think is proper for this? Okay. Because uh, obviously, I don't that's... know if you're being sarcastic, but like honestly, I'm fine if this is the discussion question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, a little sarcastic, but. I am a little curious now. What if, if you were being asked to commit torture slash murder? What kind of food or beverage would you like to be offered? What would make, would make you that more likely? <laughs> what would make it more likely for you to go through with it? Um, 
<laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> uh, I mean, to be fair, it is kind of like as shitty as it is, it is a mutually beneficial deal. Because like that is yeah. pretty damn beneficial to have that count as one of her dark and bloody things to happen. All right. I got really mm. salty about the ice cream. I like sweets. You guys probably can't tell that at all. Um, <laughs> I got salty about the sweets. Salty about the sweets. All right. So we've reached the end of the arc with this. Burp, 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 burp. Yay. All right, Malia, we get to go over um, the title. Damages. What does it mean? Yeah. Um, it seems like damages is a decent theme and title for this arc. Um, he's, I mean, Wild is really good at titling things. Um, but I was thinking about it as like, like monetary damages, you know, like um, everything in this world seems to have a price. It's very transactional. And like the concept of damages as like putting a monetary value on intangible things, right? Um, like pain and suffering is an example, a common example of damages. And like putting a monetary value on that isn't really possible. Um, mm -hmm. There's also a really lot of really awful examples of tort cases where like um, a lot of like classist and racist decisions are made by juries in terms of like if someone dies and they sue for kind of like projected future salary and like different things, it's kind of like compensating their spouse with what they would have made and different things the rest of their life, like their value kind of. Um, mm -hmm. They'll often like skew things kind of horribly depending on the person's like race and profession and a bunch of stuff okay anyway um so damages is like like everything in this universe is very like transactional um nothing is really like given for free and it seems like the that that's just like really heavily hammered in in this arc with um maggie and dealing with Blake with Blake and Rose learning about debt and prices for things with the lawyers. Um, there's just kind of a lot of that running throughout this. And then I guess, I mean like people are physically damaged a lot. In this yes. That's arc. definitely true. There's like fights and um, the, the interlude with Maggie, um, the blood and darkness and fire. I don't know. It seemed apt. I see. Where, where is this heading to next? Um, it seems like the next arc will have like Laird's response to the letter or whatever, because I don't think that him messing or like telling them about Maggie was the response. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that like we're going to keep struggling with needing power and that they're going to try and probably actually make some strides toward doing one of the big three rituals. I'm not sure that they will do that this arc, but I think that Immediately, it's going to be like dealing with whatever the fuck Laird's doing and then trying to make some big decisions about what ritual they're doing. Okay. All right. Do you have a bold and specific prediction? Because <laughs> I don't see anything written down. <laughs> yeah, I was sort of hoping that something really brilliant would come to me. Do you want to talk about the comparing to pale part first and then see if you can sure. think? Okay. Our pale in comparison section. Um, is there something that stood out to you about this section? Um Obvious question to me is, uh, how would you compare the goblins in this uh, section to what you know about them? I know we've kind of talked about that a bit, but. Yeah, um, last week we talked about that, um, which is part of why I didn't necessarily want to get into it. But it they do seem very violent and scary in a way that they aren't necessarily portrayed in pale. Mm -hmm. um, the goblins are usually like fun, slapstick, exciting and like gross and but like in a fun comedic way not like really really scary uh but like i yeah. said thinking about it a lot they um this all seems like something a goblin or a horde of goblins might do i know i was asking you last time if there was anything that you thought would uh help you be a little bit more sympathetic to maggie's uh view in terms of like what she thinks about goblins and all that. Um, I guess I'm kind of curious if like this has helped change that at all, or if you feel pretty similar to what you did last time. I feel similarly to what I did last time in terms of like, she's wrong and needs to change the way that she sees other people and 
goblins are people. Um, okay. But I do very much get why. I mean, it seems to me like her deciding to become a goblin queen has a lot to do with both like kind of like conquering and mastering her fears and her trauma. Yeah. And she's decided to like face it head on. Like she takes the book, right? Like she's like, I'm going to face this. I'm going to conquer this. I'm going to like gain power over this. Mm -hmm. Um, And then also strategically because like this goblin lady or something is going to come after her again. And so maybe the, I mean, it seems like maybe the best way to prepare for that is to like deal with and learn about goblins as much as you can. So you're more prepared either that or to become a fae person. Um, And the fae are interested in her, which is really interesting. But yeah, so I still think like wanting to enslave things is wrong and bad. But yeah, I mean, it they ruined her life and destroyed everything. So makes sense why she doesn't like them. What do you think is what do you think is more common for goblins? Like her experience, like what happened to her, or the kind of thing that is in pale? I kind of feel like more goblins are like the goblins in pale. Okay. Um but not like not necessarily like Toad Swallow, but like like the goblin like Liberty's goblins and America's goblins, like um, willing to fight, excited to get down. They are very hierarchical in terms of like who's the biggest goblin. Um, they're they're angry and or they're they are violent and crude. Um, especially with the whole like goblin fight club or whatever, baby fight club. Mm-hmm. Um but I mean, they did like a magical girl transformation with Liberty in America, where they like, you know, changed their outfits dramatically for them. Like they're just like I don't think I think most goblins are not you know super violent evil necessarily I think that they're very much pushed in that direction and I also think that like or like but on the other hand I think that like when innocence or whatever what they experience from goblins is a lot more violent and awful like I think the peckersnots of the world don't interact like the peckersnots of the world become the blunt munches of the world or they don't interact with um innocents or humans much mm-hmm. particularly because they can't get into their cities so once like goblins are like running around your cities like fucking with people like they've gone too far so like i yeah i still don't think they deserve to be enslaved <laughs> okay we'll see i mean, well, I mean as we go on okay, my i mean we'll probably see more goblins because we'll see like maggie and stuff like that so we can kind of revisit that and see like if you're more like confirmed or if it's gone the other way for you. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we'll see. Yeah. So I guess another question to compare it to pale. Um, how would, I mean, obviously as you're saying, like we see, see Maggie's relationship with her dads, um, mm-hmm. how we compare that with like the Kenneteers dads. Yeah. Well, so I was thinking that Maggie kind of strikes me as a Verona without a Lucy who has like no interest in art or anything else. Mm -hmm. Um, but then she has really good dads. So like, um, that's kind of the weird part, but I guess that's like the mitigating factor that like prevents her from being a complete like shell of a person. Cause I think that Verona without Lucy Mm -hmm. would like fucking not. And this is kind of random cutting you off, but like we were talking earlier, we can't think of a wild bro person who has a single mom raising him. Like, hello, Lucy. (laughs) Right. Well, I put the caveat of like when there's a dad available, because oh, um, got it. Lucy's dad is dead. I guess you can um, say that. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Carry on. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's just like Maggie and Verona are both like bored and don't like school and like don't have a ton of friends. I mean, it's interesting ver- watching Verona make friends with others because she's really, really good at that, but she doesn't seem that interested in other people. I'm not sure how much of that is like protectiveness for Lucy and how much of that is just like Verona. But they both, like, don't care about school and don't really know what they're doing with their lives and don't really, I don't know. And I just thought that that was sort of interesting. But Maggie's a lot more of a brat and Verona likes art. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, mean, Verona's really caring and compassionate to others. True. Um, Yeah, that's a pretty big difference there. Yeah. But also, I mean, Maggie 
kind of has some history with that. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Verona is interested in like the dark aesthetic in a way Maggie doesn't necessarily seem to be and is introduced to the Mm -hmm. practice in like a much more gentle way. Um, Mm -hmm. Verona is by this point seems some really, really fucked up shit, but is like completely determined and committed to not like, she doesn't even want to enslave the people that are like actively or not enslaved, but just like capture whatever the people who are actively attacking her town. They try everything they can to like, you know, be as good to the others as possible. And like, I think maybe Maggie isn't complete shit to her goblins or something because they just you know they were just following her like I just like she might be fine and she might have more complicated feelings about them but just the way she was talking about them was kind of gross yeah sure. well I'm they curious probably to like how people that. will respond to this opinion <laughs> <laughs> goblins are gross so they probably prefer that to anything too nice <laughs> that's true <laughs> I'm going to come back around to bold and specific prediction. So I can prompt you if you need, but Uh, yeah, what's your prompt? The prompt was, I guess, well, for one, like, do you think Maggie and Blake are going to be able to (laughs) reconcile? (laughs) What was that? I thought you were going to ask if Maggie and Blake were going to get together. No, dude. (laughs) No, no. Yeah, no, I think so. You think so? Yeah. Okay. Um, Anytime soon, or like, just like, or why, why is that? I guess we have now an explanation for why Maggie decided to do this thing that is very understandable. She seems to not want to tell Blake about it, even though she was like cool with telling Laird about it. Which maybe she's just like, oh, that was a bad decision, and now I'm not going to tell very many people about it. Mm-hmm, but I mm-hmm. think that like she'll probably talk to him about it. And he'll be like, this is still fucking awful, but cool. Okay. I think that Blake, like the Thorburns are very risky if you're Maggie, because they have a lot of knowledge about dark, scary blood fire things, right? Like they have fucking demons and like you're in this town and there's a diabolist. Like there's a decent chance that one of the horrible times you're going to deal with shit is going to involve them. So it seems like that would be a either a very useful person to have on your side or an incredibly risky person to have on your side. But Maggie seems to like take risks. Um, the other thing is that Blake needs allies. Mm-hmm. And even after hearing like to his face that like, like Maggie ordered like Molly to be tortured, he still asked her to explain and was able to like kiss her hand and everything. I just, Blake seems to have a lot of grace um, and so I think that they're going to reconcile uh, by the end of arc five, because why not? <laughs> okay. Um, do you think we're going to see the third scary prophecy thing in this story? And what would you guess that would be from if you think that that's going to be happening? Yeah, I think we will. Um, okay. This is too good and too early to not keep going. I'm also not convinced that Molly was number two, um, but we will find out. Um, okay. I think it will have something to do with demons. I think it will have something to do with Blake either accidentally releasing a demon or getting so fed up with everyone's bullshit and feeling like he's like completely pushed to the limit slash Rose. Rose is more likely, in my opinion, to use the demons. She's a little bit more ruthless. But I think that it's going to have something to do with Blake and Rose and the Demons. And my like random bold and specific prediction was that in this next arc, we're going to like talk to the Briar Girl and figure out what she wanted. Okay. Um, it's not as exciting, but it just occurred to me that like we haven't figured out why she was watching him. That's true. All right. And she wants the woods and she can't have it because there's a demon buried under the house. There's a demon buried. You don't want those just, women. Do y'all just think I'm like nuts? I just uh I mean it's someday great. I'll go into the packed spoilers section of the Discord and be like Yeah, don't <laughs> what do. were you saying about me? Yeah. Yeah. That'll be fun later on. But yeah. you'll have a lot to scroll back through. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay guys, it's time for our discussion question section for last week. Um, our discussion question was if you had to style your domain after a body part, what would you pick and why? And I've got to say, guys, I'm not going to lie. This was 
definitely a discussion question that was on the fly. You guys put a hell of a lot more thought into it than we did when we chose this question. <laughs> like, literally, I was like, oh, a water park. Wee! And all of you were just like, this is the most, like, this is by far and away the most in- interaction a response we've gotten from a question, which is really cool and exciting. But now I just, like, don't know how to come up with discussion questions. Like, now yeah, I doubt everything. Is, it's hilarious because I feel like some of our other ones, we've, like, put a lot of thought into it and been like, oh, yeah, this is a good one. This will get responses and we'll get, like, a few. And then this one we're like, oh, yeah, let's pick a body part. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Um, and, and we've, like, grouped these by body part and we have 16 body parts and a lot of the body parts 16. have multiple people who respond. <laughs> Holy crap. No, thank so, you guys. Thank you. But, like, what the fuck? It's a lot. Holy shit. We don't um, <laughs> yeah, we're pretty happy. But um, all right. So we'll start with the first one, which is the eyes. Um, so we had four people choose the eyes. Uh, Mega Fire 7, Ace of Sword, Xerxes Praelor, and Lapsed Classicist. Um, so, these people are saying um, eyes are good because they work, well, for one thing, um, can work well with having a big window in your home. You can open and close the eye by drawing the curtains open or closed. Uh, a lot of times you're very focused, or you'd probably be fo- very focused on what's happening outside. Um You'd also get fun associations like keeping an eye on someone or something, <laughs> which is kind of fun. Um also to see better, um, they're saying just because um, a lot of this is from Mega Fire Seven. We did get a few things from some other people that kind of put it into this as well, but it's a lot of Mega Fire Seven's wording um, because you'd be so focused on the outside um, to see better. Um, you'd have to remove light sources from within the eye, um, but you could do potentially a lot of fun stuff with different lenses or focuses. You could possibly use it as an observatory with some changes. Um, possibly do augury or astrology that's just the first one <laughs> yeah so then the skull um the leg tall um picked the skull they said it's great for aesthetics true also for aligning with spirits um you can take advantage of all the different spaces like maybe you store memories in the brain cavity um it can keep you honest and true to yourself um and to the you know your capital s self uh, and it's intimidating as fuck. So, good That's job. True. All right. Um, let's see. Captain Rhino chose the brain. Um, first of all, said that it rhymes with domain. <laughs> 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 That's so dumb. I love it. Um, I mean, it's true. What a what better reason to choose a domain than the rhyming, right? <laughs> um, but they're also saying it can give power to different parts of the brain to boost practice and capital S self. Um could boost things like action, cognition, sense awareness, and creativity. Hey, um, hey, Jen. Hey, yes. I have a joke really fast. Okay. It's a domain in the membrane. <laughs> oh, my God. I feel like part of my uh, domain <laughs> brain just died a little bit with I'm that. Sorry. But that's okay. I th- no, you, th- that, that's an important one to keep in. You can't cut that out. You got to keep that in. <laughs> oh my goodness all right no i do appreciate dumb jokes so thank you for that um <laughs> captain rhino was saying the downsides of a brain domain uh, or that it can be very easy to get all navel gazy and self-reflective while inside at the expense of doing things out in the real world and if you mess things up by amping up the wrong thing or failing to maintain balance or just not understanding exactly what you're doing um, because brains are super mega complicated, then it can trash you beyond repair, both spiritually and mentally. Bummer. Bummer. Um, Manukos chose the entire head. Um, it just reminds me of um, what Bill Tall was saying about different parts of the skull being useful for different things. Obviously, um, so the mouth is like an entry hall with dramatic entries and exits. Um, good ventilation because of your nose. Um, your eyes would make great windows. Um, brain is storage room, similar. Um, and your hair would be like a nice garden. That's right. You could prune your hair and, you know, it'd be pretty Style sweet. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, bisexual Punch Party chose the liver. Um, they're saying it 
filters toxins, produces useful body chemicals, and stores excess, excess nutrients. So it would serve as a natural regulator for an area. Um, could use it to process spirits to maintain balance. Um, they're saying it's also resilient to attack. Um, as your liver can regenerate, your domain would be able to regenerate when up to half is destroyed or damaged. Um, bones was a popular one. Um, Sengachi, Macy One, Spellhex, and Alex V all picked Bones. Possibly other people did as well. It was a little hard to keep track. <laughs> um, but some of the reasons people said was it's a solid foundation, good aesthetics, um, and it's protective um, because of like your bone marrow and also just like bones, ribs, things like that. Um, the R, the red blood cells and white blood cells. Yep, that's what that stands for. Sorry. I was going to say the RBCs, and I was like, that. Um, but the, the red blood cells provide nourishment because um, of, like, the bone marrow again. Um, and there's adipose tissue, which is comfy furniture. Yes. Yay, yay fat. Yay. <laughs> so, yeah, white blood cells, they're your defense mechanism, so they can get all the bad, dirty spirits and junk out. Red blood cells carry oxygen and stuff around, so. Those are the inner tubes in my fun water park domain. <laughs> Um, let me see. So, Tizza Tizzarat chose the limbic system. Um, they're saying um can be used to restore equilibrium. Um, uh, you'd have great memory storage via the hippocampus. Um, and the amygdala detects threats. So that'd be really good for security. My tallest had a really um thoughtful and interesting response about kidneys. Um, his son has a medical condition, and so he's learned a lot about kidneys um, throughout his son's life. Um, so that he or they, sorry, they identified like three main things, filtration being one of them. So you maybe you could use your domain to like take in power from different sources and kind of filter the bad parts of that power out. Hmm. Um, you could attach more kidneys. A lot of people, um, you don't take the kidney out when you do a transplant. You just shove more kidneys in. Um, so maybe you could have like more domain. Um, and then the word renal, um, shares a root with the word reins, something about, um, people back in the old Roman days thinking that like the left kidney pulls you toward evil and the right kidney pulls you toward good. So maybe hmm. this sort of keeps you centered, um, or it could be a good way to track karma. Um, That's and interesting. Because of this, my tallest thinks that the kidneys are the perfect choice if you're planning on practicing karmic law. So they apparently know more about it than I do. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's great. Um, Oh, thank you, Kippos, for changing (laughs) your uh, username for this. Um, So this is Uwu's in my podcast. Oh, I think Um, it's Uwu's in my podcast. (laughs) Oh, woos in my podcast said titty, <laughs> which makes sense based on the username. Um, they were saying life, cold and hard, titty, warm, soft. There you go. Um, they're also saying, um, or she was also saying, alternatively, you could <laughs> Alcazar your own boobs and make that your domain. I'm sure that would be fine. It wouldn't be weird at all also happy pride also trans rights (laughs) (laughs) Woo! (laughs) um i just like i i I mean that's great i'm just like thank thank you for making me say that (laughs) it was in my podcast like i never i don't think i've ever said that out loud it was was. (laughs) and i've said it too many times all right all right next (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, um, a bird chose the hand. I thought this one was really interesting, kind of like a base of operations, um, but also a way to like extend and exert yourself in different situations. So like if you were going into the ruins on like an expedition, you could like go into your domain and like kind of like be held into your in your hand, like safe and extended into the ruins kind of a thing. It was a really interesting concept about like, like, grasping and protection and like how well you know your hands and how well you know yourself it was just yeah it was really neat okay can i do this Um, next one (laughs) yes all right um definitely kippos said a butt because i am one 
And also, I stole Elliot's rocket launcher unfairly. Yes. This is how you can tell we filter out um, <laughs> all frivolous and silly comments. We um, are here for the drama. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, next, uh, Jonah Lith picked the nervous system, um, which is very interesting. Um, they're saying they picked it because it was central. It's a fortified hub. Um, nerves extending throughout the city, um, good regulation of body temperature, and sense of respond um, to things and changes. Um, Mirth Strike was the only one that we saw who picked the heart. Um, mm -hmm. It was an interesting, like, funny four-for-one deal with Chambers in Your Domain. Um, but, um, sure. um, and about the heart, like, symbolically, the constant thrum, um, hearts being the source of, like, courage and motivation, um, and kind of like feeding you with vitality uh, while you're in your domain kind of a thing. I wonder if there's, because I'm like, technically you can only go in one direction, like from one chamber to the, the oh, next. Interesting. You got those heart, heart That'd valves. That'd be inconvenient. <laughs> Just it like could be, around. but I guess I've, you could probably, you know, make that into a thing. But <clears throat> I'm like, hmm. Anyway. Um, so... Now we get to our three last ones. Um, we, if y'all remember, we did not limit this to human body parts, or organs. Um, these last three people chose non-human ones. Woo! Um, so Kubareth chose a turtle shell. Um, said it would be very defensible. Um, possible, possible mystic world turtle significance. So you could potentially get a good amount of power for that, especially adding a garden on top. Mm hmm. Um, Beard of Valor, surprisingly and somewhat disappointingly, did not choose Beard. Um, but they chose a tail. Uh, the tail follows you closely. It is expressive. It can express your personality, um, can keep parasites off of you. It helps with your balance. Um, it can propel you forward. It can stun enemies. Um, yeah, we used to oh, have a our dog. dog. Um, I thought Beard of Valor was saying this, and I was like, what are you doing? No. No, um, I put a little comment just because um, we had a dog growing up who seriously had a tail of steel, um, has mm -hmm. knocked multiple people over, including mm -hmm. like a six foot tall South African man, mm -hmm. um, which I just find very impressive because, yeah, and her tail was, yeah, it was just like. It hurt really bad, which was really sad because she'd be so happy, right? And she'd run she up to you. She was so happy, but man, it would leave and it bruises was just like, bam, all bam, over bam. your legs. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, dang. Like, <laughs> she, we're pretty sure she broke in it at least twice when you'd like feel down along it. There yeah. were little like notches in it. And, but we didn't know because she never she was just like, feel it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She was just like, she was just happy as could be going around trying to knock over everybody. I think she knocked over our grandma once. Um, didn't she knock over Tutu? I don't remember. That I feel like she possible. did. Yeah. I mean, uh, what a dog. She, <laughs> she was, was so a great good. dog. Um, Beard of Valor also says they want multiple tails, get multiple benefits, you know? Yeah. All right. And last but not least, we have Spinagon. Um, they chose a dragon scale um, due to defensive um, capabilities and passive magic. All right. Thank you, guys. Look at this. Almost 15 minutes talking about discussion question. It blew my mind. Thank you so much for participating. Really appreciate it, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, we appreciate you. <laughs> we appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I guess I'll mention the discussion question real quick. Yeah. I mean, we already said it earlier. Do we yeah. want to do it again? Yeah. I'll just, okay. Just to reiterate it. If we, if someone wanted you to torture someone or basically make a deal with you that you had to do something pretty unappealing, um, what food or drink could they offer you to make you more likely to say yes? Um, <laughs> also kind of on top of it, just because it is, we're ending an arc. If you guys have any questions or concerns i mean i'm hoping you don't have concerns but besides maybe my anger problems with ice cream but if you have any uh, questions that you want to ask us um, feel free be happy to answer some for you next episode um, yeah we also um speaking of might plug some in occasionally to 
our episodes just kind of like one at a time. We don't really know what we're doing. Um, but we got a question from Heavenly Scarification on Discord and we thought we'd answer it. Um, and so maybe depending on the volume of questions or whatever, we'll just sort of plug them into some episodes. Um, but we thought this was a good one and we kind of wanted to talk about it. Mm-hmm. So she asks, um, considering what we've been learning from Pale Impact about karma, are there any situations so far in Pact or Pale where you think karma has laid its hands on the scales, either for someone with positive or negative karma? I say definitely yes. Um, gonna probably skip over the really obvious ones with force wearing. <laughs> because <laughs> um, that's like well you know everybody uh, Charles. knows that mine that I thought of probably to be honest isn't a great example just because a lot of you are going to be like that's a stretch but I said I don't know it's just in a way Alexander just how he ended up dying and everything I'm not sure what his karma was probably honestly was pretty good because he knew how to game the system mm-hmm. but it's still like kind of feel like just like in terms of the world karma he may have had positive karma but like man he was a little shithead well, yes but i also to support your argument he was like bristow was in charge of the school right like he had taken over a whole bunch of stuff um mm-hmm. and then alexander was supposed to like come back in and like strike this final blow to like for victory or whatever to like, because he was like really on the back foot. He lost a whole bunch of his apprentices, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think karma was like not on his side at that point. And then he doesn't win necessarily like the Kenneteers do. The Kenneteers explicitly say like, fuck you, go away. And so I think that maybe his practice or his, his karma wasn't that good at this point. It kind of felt like he was like, Oh, I'm the hero of this story. And this is the part where I like rally my forces and come back like swinging or whatever, like again. But I think maybe that this is a good example. Yeah. The one that popped into my head was Clementine. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that it's kind of amazing. She's still alive. Um, considering all the shit that's happened to her throughout her life. I mean, she has a little bit of that innocence protection still, but she's also just the amount of horrifying shit that she deals with on a regular basis that is very dangerous and awful. And she mm-hmm. like lives and functions. Like it seems to me like maybe she has decent karma. Um, I mean, I want her to because she's like such a great person, but there might be some sort of like karmic system or whatever that she's playing into because karma, it wants you to like, do the thing the world wants you to. And so maybe she's, I don't know that one. Also, I feel like it's a stretch, but yeah. Clementine deserves good things. Emily, you also had another one you brought up. Yeah. um, I was trying to think of one from pact. I mean, we know that Blake has shit karma, but uh, like the thing, the only thing I could really think of was like Laird. Um, It seems like things go pretty well for him in his life. I was thinking like, Oh, he's a cop. People like cops. I bet the spirits like cops. Um, They keep the system going. Procedural dramas or whatever are really popular. And um, because he has a relatively high position in the town and stuff, he can probably like get good karma and kind of like channel that toward himself. I can't think of an instance necessarily where karma has laid its hand on the scales, but just kind of like so far, at least seem things seem to really be working out for Laird. Mm-hmm. Um, True. Also, wait, how many times has he showed up at his door? Was this just the second time? I think so. Ooh, waiting oh. for the third time Laird shows up oh, at the door. No. Is that going to be yeah. his next move? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, thanks for listening, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode, you'd like to help support the podcast, please subscribe, share it with your friends, and leave a rating and review. To support our podcast, become a Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia. If you'd like to support Wildbo as he continues to write fantastic stories, go to patreon.com slash Wildbo. You can follow the pod on Twitter at Pale Comparison or send us an email at paleincomparisonpod at gmail.com. Keep an eye out for our Reddit thread in r slash parahumans where you can answer our discussion question and share your thoughts on this episode. In addition, if you'd like to see all of my predictions laid out, check out our episode description for a link to a prediction tracker. 
All right. This week's fun fact is actually inspired by a pretty recent Ducast episode. Um, they went over Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. So when Blackbeard would capture ships, many of the African slaves on board would actually go on to become pirates. And when Blackbeard died, nearly one third of his total crew were former slaves. Which is pretty interesting. It's kind of badass. Right? Bye, guys. Bye.